Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Product Information and the Customer Experience. My name's Kate and I'll be your host. Today's speakers are Aaron Vandenacker, who's the Product Marketing Director, and Chip Gettinger, who's VP Global Solutions Consulting here at SDL. We're expecting that today's webinar will last around 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. If you have any questions throughout the, the webinar, can then you please pop them into the Q&A box, which is in the Ask a Question tab. I'm now going to pass you over to Arian to begin the webinar. Thank you, Kate, and welcome, everyone. And Chip, welcome on the webinar as well. We're going to co-present here, so I'm pleased to work together with you on this webinar. So we have an interesting topic today, I think, that we're going to cover around product information and the customer experience, because I think in many cases, people do not necessarily associate those two things. Um, in many cases, they're being treated as siloed operations. And I think this quote from a company called Simple A really dovetails with what I just said, because um, if you think about it from a customer perspective, Basically, every content that a customer finds out there about your company or your products serves as marketing material because it gives them an impression of your company. So, and the other way around, nowadays, virtually all marketing out there is based on content. If you look at what people are doing before they actually buy a product, they research online, um, they might eventually go to a shop maybe to look at the physical product, but a lot of the buying cycle, whether it's B2C or B2B, has already been conducted based on existing content out there. So virtually all marketing is based on content these days, and yeah, most of the content out there serves as marketing material for your organization. Could be good marketing, could be bad marketing based on what sort of content they find. If it's a poor review about your product, clearly it's bad marketing. If it's a great review or some other information that answers the question they have, it's great marketing. And if you think about the role of marketing in this regard, it's interesting to look at how this has sort of yeah, changed over the last years. So if we look at the typical buying cycle from consideration, evaluation, purchase, and post-purchase, and then the loyalty loop that is following after that, I think it has changed dramatically over the last, well, if I say decade, maybe it's even a bit more than that. But these buying patterns that customers, B2B and B2C customers, are sort of showing has changed dramatically. So let's do a little bit of a, of a dive into what has been happening throughout the year. So for the consideration phase, not so long ago, people would rely on marketing information. Could be advertising, could be a TV ad that they were seeing. So advertising or other marketing materials would really drive the consideration phase of any customer experience that could be partially online, partially offline. Then if people have sort of understanding of what products and companies are out there, they would go into the evaluation phase. And again, this would be very much driven by marketing materials that they find out there. Maybe again some advertising, some online stuff they would be looking at, user-generated content, maybe they look at forums or other stuff. But a lot of this has been in the realm of marketing for many years. Well, at some point, they hopefully buy your product or service. Um, Clearly, your sales team from your organization would be involved, your sales department, or maybe it's a physical store that they would go to. And if this is about a B2B purchase, clearly there are contracts and legal uh, paperwork that are involved in this phase of the customer journey as well. And then after the product has been purchased, this is traditionally where product information becomes relevant. Product information, support information, service materials, this is really about enabling people to, well, implement the product or install the product, start using it. If they have an issue, maybe troubleshoot it and fix the issue. If they want to use a feature that they don't know or understand, they would go into the product information and look up how this feature would work. So we see there's a clear segmentation of what sort of information is being used in what phase of the, uh, of the customer journey. And then in order to become a loyal customer in the long run, I think that has, for many years, been a combination of, well, good support so that if there is a problem, you can call the help desk, somebody picks up the phone and gives you the answer that you're looking for. And maybe there's a marketing program like a loyalty program or something else in place that would support the loyalty for, for yeah, ongoing customer satisfaction. Now, if we look at how this has been changing over the years and what we are doing today, it's quite a different view. And I think especially the need for any type of information to be accessible 
at any point in that customer journey is, is really a big change that we've seen happening. So all these types of information, they're not linked to any particular phase of the customer journey anymore. They're really, well, they, people need ubiquitous access and then it needs to be 24-7. They need access whenever they want it, or on whatever device they would like to uh, have access to it. So that is quite a dramatic shift in, well, the role of content for the customer journey. And we refer to this as omni-content because it can be sourced from a lot of different places inside the company, outside the company, communities. It's not linked to a particular phase or a particular department anymore. And this notion of omni-content is really what is driving the customer journey today. And you hear stats out there uh, saying that 60, 70, 80 percent of the customer journey and the customer research has been conducted and carried out based on content that people find before they engage with the company or a salesperson uh, to actually yeah, start the actual buying process. So this is a big change in behavior and the role and yeah, the importance of content for today's customers. Now, if we look at that, um, and this is the result of a bit of research that STL has been doing in conjunction with Forrester, where we asked uh, a number of organizations where do you see the popularity or where do you see delivery formats of content shifting towards to? And th this is not a surprise. You see web pages is number one. So what this actually says is that over the next two years, because that was the question that was being asked, over the next two years, 70%, 77% of organizations think they will need to manage approximately 40% more web pages than they do today. So web pages are really the workhorse of the digital experience of the online uh, yeah, journey that people are conducting. The role of video is increasing, but then interestingly, you see already chatbots and virtual assistants on the third place, which is quite a dramatic increase also compared to where we are today. And then you see mobile messaging presentations, voice interestingly is on the rise. Uh, but if you look at the top three, I think there are two, well, three clear winners here. Web pages continue to be extremely important for any customer journey. And I'm emphasizing this because we are going to look at a different stat in a few minutes that is actually uh, sort of contradicting what we see here in terms of product information. The web pages are the workhorse, more rich engaging materials through video, and the rise of the chatbots and the virtual assistants to do more of the support and help tasks. Now, and indeed, um, Again, based on research that we've conducted, we found that 82% of customers expect easy access to basically any sort of content. So this only content notion, it's really what we see customers are in need of. They want not just the marketing content, but also product information and user reviews, user generated content, uh, all yeah, easily accessible so that they can make an informed purchase decision. So, and they want that at any time in that customer journey that we just saw. Now, interestingly, the same number shows up from a different uh, research that we've done. Companies agree with this notion of content being critical to their company's success in achieving top business objectives. So this is about revenue growth and geographic expansion. They all have their strategic top line business objectives. And they all agree, basically, that content is critical to achieving those objectives. And now we're getting a bit more specific because what we see is that there is a very, yeah, I would almost say a specific uh, tension and a specific slant towards the importance of product information as part of that customer journey and as part of the online content that needs to be accessible. Because 77% 77 of companies say that product information, keeping it relevant, up to date, consistent, making it easy to access across channels and also across different languages is critical to good customer experience. So it's not necessarily the marketing content that is uh, that critical. Clearly, it is important. But it was a very, very important takeaway for us when we did this research that product information bubbled up as one of the key critical enablers for better customer experiences. And this is uh, a final step that I'm going to show here based on some research with Forrester again. Looking at product information again, it turned out that this is this having the single greatest positive impact on customer experiences when you compare it to the other types of information. So if you look at the different departments inside an organization that are producing content, typically marketing produces a lot of content, 
sales, whether that is online sales or maybe uh, in-person meetings with PowerPoints, but there are sales material support information. But product information turned out it's almost double the amount of impact on improving customer experiences overall compared to the other types of information that are being produced. Well, that's a big takeaway for anyone who's in the process or in a department that, uh, that is responsible for producing product information, because I doubt that this, well, this insight and this, this uh, yeah, notion of having such a great impact on customer experience is recognized throughout the organization. I'm not sure if you would go to your CEO or maybe your CMO or your marketing leadership and you would tell them this story that they would immediately think, oh yes, product information is critical for our customers. But the research shows that it is truly the case. And now here's the sort of uh, paradox, because if you look at the way product information is currently being produced and currently being distributed to customers, yeah, there's a sort of discrepancy between what we just saw and today's reality. Because if we go from left to right on this slide, you see here the first uh, icon that shows you product information has high and consistent involvement throughout the life cycle. That's the sort of stats that we were just showing you. It is critical for that customer experiences. Then the other stat that we saw is that web pages are still on the rise. They are the workhorse of the digital experience and the demand for web pages is still growing. So we need to put more content out there on web pages because that is how customers are most likely to find it. But then on the third column here, you see product professionals in most organizations are least likely to deliver content in a web delivery format. They are still very much tied to delivery either in print or PDF or file-based delivery rather than in a more dynamic web-based way. And that is a very important finding because that sort of goes against what customers are looking for and where we see that uh, they are going to be accessing or trying to access this product information in the future, which is on web pages. And then the last uh, finding that we came up with is that it's about 57 or so, let's say half of firms agree that product information is translated and delivered in the same way as other content. So what this means basically is that product information is still being created, managed and delivered in a silo, in an organizational silo, which means that probably from a customer's perspective, it's also a siloed experience. It's not integrated with the rest of the customer journey. It's quite likely that they will have to go to a separate area on the website and um, yeah, maybe look even in a different system. It's quite likely that the branding might not be consistent with the rest of the experience they have. So this is quite a big takeaway also that within the organizations, companies need to rethink the way how they can better integrate the processes, uh, the way that product information is being created, translated, translated and delivered and make it more aligned with the rest of the organization. So some real important key takeaways here from the research that we've done. Um, so what I'd like to do now is hand over to you, Chip, to talk a little bit more about this notion of only content and uh, how you deliver that in a more consistent way. Sure, Arian. Thank you very much. That's very interesting research about the delivery formats, and I, I really feel that uh, how you know how can we as uh, companies better deliver our content and more relevant customer experience product information and. Really, we're going to look at some examples now of how to do that and a little bit under the hood, how it could be managed uh, within your organization today. So one of the key takeaways from the, the STL and Forrester research is around product information. And as Arian, as you well said, typically that is either siloed away, it's on its own website, uh, at, at even more advanced companies, but rarely is it really accessible to a consumer who is trying to make, uh, let's say, product uh, decisions. So in our Omni content example here, I want to look at, I'm researching uh, residential solar panels. And obviously, there is a number of considerations that I need to do that. You know, what's the impact on, on my house? Um, are there rebates available from the local government? You know, what are some of the technical specifications? So. It's not unusual for product information to have to really be gelled together. So when we start looking at some of the examples that we're working on, um, if I go under the hood and take a look at this from a, a web developer standpoint, I can start to access product information directly on a web page when I'm 
uh, inserting and creating this page. So, and, and, and this is an example of some SDL approaches, is we have an easy-to-use widget that allows the web developer, the uh, information uh, uh, creator, the ability to apply uh, product information or metadata that's relevant for this particular product and so forth. The real benefit to that is that when a consumer is doing their research on the product information, uh, it will show up directly on this web page. And unfortunately, I can't scroll down and show more detail here on, on the Bright Talk. But essentially what we've done is, is we've mixed in marketing information about the product and also more perhaps technical product information that could give me more of the specifications that I may want to have as a user. So this is a really important what we've been calling mashup of the ability to take content from various places, the omni-content idea, and bring it forward to a customer, to a user, who has a, a single experience to be able to read and apply it and understand it. So the other real benefit is on search optimization. So what this also does is it allows your customers to have a much more seamless uh, experience at trying to find and evaluate the content. Uh, we know there are competitors out there that sell other solar panels. So we want to ensure that our customers see the information that's relevant to what they're trying to research in a very quick and, and uh, easy to find fashion. So it's pretty much a quick example of how we can kind of just converge different uh, uh, content types, you know, in this omni-content approach, which, by the way, Arne, I love that, that term, omni-content. Yeah, and interestingly, so, so, Jim, just to chime in here, because if you think about the SEO impact, and um, I mean, I'm, I'm in marketing myself, and I know as a company we're always struggling with, okay, how do we improve our search engine rankings, right? So that's any marketer is involved in that, in that process of, okay, optimizing your pages for keywords and trying to climb the ladder in terms of search engine rankings and search engine optimization. But one of the key critical things, of course, that search engines are looking for when they, when they crawl your website is what content is actually on there. And how relevant is that to the search queries that uh, that are being conducted on that search engine? And marketers, well, they can optimize the existing pages, but it's very hard for them to create additional pages with new content because they're always under well resource and time constraints. So who is going to create all that content? I think that's one of the big struggles that most marketers are facing today. Whereas at the same time, they're sitting on this gold mine of product content that remains usually untapped because it usually sits somewhere in a support section and it's locked up in those PDF files that, well, that are hard to index and that definitely don't directly give you the answer that the customer is looking for. The best case is Google gives you the PDF and you have to download it and then do a search in the PDF, which might be a couple of hundred pages, and maybe you find a snippet of text that you were looking for. Now, if you bring all this product information, like the example you were just showing on the solar panels, if you bring that product information actually inside the HTML experience, inside those marketing pages, what you will see is an enormous boost in terms of the way your pages are being ranked by Google, because there is a lot more relevant content that they can crawl. Could be inside those pages. Maybe you've got other pages with pure product information. But just by taking it outside of the PDF, envelope and putting it on your website, you will see that it can have a dramatic positive impact on your search engine rankings. And I think that's a critical story that the product teams can talk about with their marketing peers and say, well, dear marketing colleagues, I can help you with your search engine uh, initiatives by, if you, would to, if you were to tap into my product information and make it part of that experience rather than keeping it siloed, locked away in a support section that uh, where people need to go to and start a new custom, new customer journey, basically. They need to search again for the same mm. solar panel they were just looking for. They need to remember the model or the type they were just looking at and do the same search, and then they get you know, God knows how many results, and they have to find their way through all that new content that they suddenly are being exposed to. <laughs> so I think it's a critical part to talk to marketers about the impact that the product information might be having on their overall uh, customer yeah, experience. And Arian, that's a great example. And from a product information perspective, you're right. Many times the content has been siloed as documentation, uh, user guides, reference manuals, and it's difficult to expose that to customers. But really, the approach that we're proposing here 
takes the richness that many of us have invested in the product information and our documentation per se, unlock it from a PDF, make it more HTML friendly, to really then expose it along with other content. So we're really marrying up the benefits of marketing, which really understands the, the whole omni-content approach of how can we get the best content to our customers as mixing that in with the customer experience, the richness that we've had in the product documentation and product information that has been uh, hidden away for many years. So, you know, many times, Ari and I get questions about, well, how do we enable this kind of an approach? So obviously, many of us know that Google, we can't really fool Google anymore on search terms and so forth. So how do, we, how do we really get more relevancy out of our content when we're looking at uh, the structures and the information? And the real key is uh, the taxonomies that you design and look at within your uh, content and, and your organization. So I think many of us know what taxonomies are, but just to make sure, really, it's really a practice and a science of classifying things or concepts. And, and really, at its simplest form, it creates hierarchy out of the uh, metadata that applies to the content. So if we take this example of geography, uh, obviously we have you know, various continents and countries and so forth. And within your product information that you produce along with your other marketing content, you probably have taxonomies that are in use today because they really do help provide that structure and they allow the content to become much more searchable. And, and this is true both for internal organizations or across your corporate website in the examples that Aryan has given here. And the other thing, most importantly, are people outside your corporate walls. And Val Swisher is uh, a founder and CEO of Content Rules, has done a lot of really nice work on this area. The idea is, is from let's look at the content from an outside in view. How can our customers find more relevant content that they need for their particular use case and what they're trying to research and so forth? So one of the things that we really promote is this concept of intelligent content. And, and really intelligent content drives through the taxonomies. Uh, and, you know, even beyond and beyond search and discovery, what we're finding is how can I group and create relationships with content? So perhaps, for example, um, back to my solar panels example, I want to know if there's batteries associated with them and how much power can they store and so forth. I can go into a relationship or links that take me to different areas across my content. This is really critical for when we're designing content, is not only understanding the content itself, but its relationships. And in other webinars, we've talked about moving into components of authoring, where topics are reused and so forth. But the really key benefit here is around the ability to support integrations and interoperability. Arian, for example, earlier you brought up chatbots. So what this is mean is, is that uh, we have the ability, perhaps, to not only have content appear on web pages, but we can take that same content and have it appear in other delivery formats, depending on the needs of our customers. So having that independence really does create that uh, exciting part, and also the improvements that, Arian, you mentioned on the uh, research completed earlier. So Arian, I believe now you're going to talk a little bit more about what we do at SDL. Yeah, thank you. So clearly, and I don't want to make this a product pitch, but I just want to sort of try to yeah show how technically companies can actually make something like this happen. And as an example, I will use the SDL solution and show you how we are doing that and how we can actually bring these different types of information together in a single experience. And there are some technical prerequisites also that you will yeah that are important to to know about and to understand. Uh, because the, those will be needed to make something like this real, yeah, real and come to life. So the solution that SCL takes to market is called SCL 3D in DX, DX for digital experience, and it's really about the continuity uh, between the different phases of that customer experience that we are trying to bridge with this solution. So you see in the bottom row here, you see marketing content, commerce content, and product and support content. And this is yeah, the sort of types of information that an organization would be uh, creating and managing and delivering to the customer. 
But in many cases, you will see in organizations that they are using different siloed systems for this. So marketing content is typically being delivered through a web content management system. If you are selling online, your commerce content will probably sit in a PIM system or an e-commerce system or some sort, which might or might not be integrated properly with your website. In many cases, you still go to a separate shop.company.com domain, and you sort of end up in a different shopping experience. And then the product and support content in many organizations are being managed either yeah, in the old-fashioned desktop publishing style with file-based PDF output, which is then uploaded onto the website or into a portal type of environment. And we don't, we don't really expect that those silos internally in the organization will go away anytime soon. Uh, but what we do believe is that at the time you start to create an experience and you want to deliver all that electronic digital content to a customer, that's where you need to join up the different types of information. So the layer where you see omni-content delivery is actually the technology in our product stack that takes content from multiple backend sources, the web content from 3D sites, the commerce content from third-party commerce and uh, and PIM systems, and then the product and support content from our solution called STL 3D and Docs. And it brings it together to deliver that single experience to the customer where you can blend the marketing content with a bit of product information, specific topics from the data content that you might be managing. And there could be commerce capabilities as well. So if this is about an accessory or a product that you would want to sell online, you can bring in the commerce capabilities as well. Now, the sort of companies we're doing this for are not the sort of uh, smaller shops. It's really global enterprises. So you see language as a sort of row spanning across all three. And that's where SDL helps organizations with language technology as well as services to uh, streamline the process of creating and translating all that content in a consistent way using terminology bases, using translation memories, or using translation management system to speed up that process and ensure there is consistency across the different information types. And then at the top, you see how that content is being delivered to any channel or any device. And we'll get back to that later in terms of how you can enable this omni-device delivery, because that requires some very specific technology to make that happen. So this is the overall concept of 3 and DX and the, and the technology stack. And now the interesting part when we're talking about taxonomies, is, is actually happening here in this only content delivery layer. Because if you are sort of yeah, sourcing content from multiple backend systems, how do you dynamically bring those different types of information together when a customer visits your website? Well, the way you can do that is with taxonomies. Because by tagging information consistently across the different backend systems, you can dynamically blend information at delivery time. So if you think about a simple example of the solar panels we were just looking at, if that marketing content is, is a web page that describes a specific type of solar panel, a model, or a series number, then the model and the series number could be the, the, the metadata that you would classify that web page with. So that would be part of your taxonomy, the product number and the product family, for instance. If you use those same tags, those same taxonomy terms, in the product information tooling that you're using, and you tag it consistently, then when these two types of information need to be blended together on a page, it can be a dynamic process that doesn't require any manual intervention. And I think that is critical because if you have five or 10 products, you could say, well, we'll just manually create those pages and we'll bring together the information from the different pieces. But if you've got 1,000 or 10,000 or more products, that needs to be automated. And that is really where the taxonomy can help you uh, by dynamically blending these different types of backend content into a single web experience. Now, if I move on a little bit further and look a bit more under the hood, and what we've now done, it, this is the same diagram that we were just looking at, but we'll go into a little bit more of the architecture to show how this is really working. So we've sort of uh, yeah, rotated the diagram that you just saw by 90 degrees. So you see on the left-hand side the actual backend systems where the authoring is happening, so web content, product information, uh, that could be 3D insights and 3D and docs in the case of SDL technology. And then that omni-content delivery layer, it's technology that we ship that is called dynamic experience delivery. So both these two backend systems, they can publish information into this dynamic delivery tier, and that is where the dynamic blending and the taxonomy mashups, et cetera, are happening. And then towards the front end, 
traditionally you would want to probably deliver this to a website. But we see more and more other types of digital front-end technologies emerge where you would like to publish to as well. So there's this notion of single-page applications, which is like it, it behaves like a website. It runs in a browser, but it, it looks like it's actually an application like you would install in your phone. And clearly, there might be phones or tablets or other types of touch points that need to be, um, yeah, that need to be the actual delivery uh, device where you need to publish your content to. And then from that, actually, the, the, the visitors would, would consume that, actually, that information in the end. So this is the sort of high-level overview of how a delivery mechanism would work from the back end to the front end. And I believe, Chip, that you're going to show in a little bit more detail now what that actually looks like in the case of SDL Tridium, correct? That's right, Arian. Thanks. And so um, for many of you, whoops, sorry about that. For many of you who have been working with perhaps SDL Tridium sites, the structured content management system for a number of years, you've invested in, in the structured data XML content. And so that remains very much part of this uh, solution. And what's new to this is the ability now to apply taxonomy values uh, within the Tridian Sites uh, um, information, uh, product information content. And the idea is, is that we can synchronize the same taxonomy between uh, Tridian uh, Sites and Tridian Docs. So we now have that ability to have common uh, metadata that gets applied if you're a marketer or if you're creating the product uh, content for your documentation and so forth. And this metadata then gets bound to that particular uh, content, no matter what type it is, and gets published out to our dynamic experience delivery channel, which I'll look at in a little bit more detail in a minute. The idea is then is that and a web page that gets designed, uh, a web designer can look at different types of content that gets put onto that page. And so for the example we had earlier, the solar panels, as a web designer, I can now pick and choose to whether I want to have uh, web content or structured content appear. And, and really, from a customer's perspective, I really don't care what the source of that content is. And Arian, do you have anything more to add around the, the GraphQL or the DXA experience here? Yeah, so that's an interesting question because um, it's something that a lot of companies, I think, in the past have been struggling with when you think about how do you actually build your website. So where it says web application, it's just, let's say, it's the technical term for building your website. And what you see a lot of companies, what, what, well, what they're still doing today is whenever they are redesigning their website or they're switching their content management system, they basically start from scratch. It's like a toolbox um, where you have to start from scratch building your website. Think about it as you're buying Microsoft Excel. Uh, it's a tool, but there's no spreadsheet in there. You still need to build the spreadsheet from scratch to, to, to make use of the tool. Otherwise, it's just an empty tool with no content in it. And the spreadsheet sort of brings Microsoft Excel to life. Well, the same thing is true for a content management system. The web application is actually the thing that the customer gets to see when they come to your website. That's really what brings your CMS to life. But building such a web application, such a website, is quite a big, big job. And what we've been doing with our Tridian technology is we we sort of looked at what, is, what are the commonalities between all the websites that are being built out there. We look at, let's say, all of our customers, what are the commonalities, what are the sort of things that we do over and over again when we build such a digital experience. And we've put that all together in a best practice implementation, which is called the Digital Experience Accelerator. That's what DXA stands for. So this accelerator is basically an out-of-the-box implementation of a vanilla website that you can then subsequently tailor to your specific needs, and you can brand it accordingly, etc. But a lot of the groundwork has been done, and a lot of the plumbing you don't need to do from scratch, but it's already there. So 50, 60% of your web implementation comes out of the box, and you just need to tailor it to whatever you think your specific web page and your digital experience should look like. So that's a very important notion. And whenever companies are, are adopting our technology, or even if they're already on our technology but they're on an older version, they would typically use the DXA to spin up new websites. So you can do that very quickly. You can be up and running in no time. And it saves a lot of yeah, implementation time, basically, to get your applications out there. Now, GraphQL is a 
much more efficient and modern way to, to query that internal database that sits in the middle. So dynamic experience delivery is the technology. In many cases, it can be cloud hosted, but it can be on premises as well. But that's where the database basically sits that holds all that content, both the structured content as well as the web content. And the traditional way of accessing that type of information is through uh, RESTful APIs, and then you query content. But to populate a web page, you might have to go 10, 20, 30 times to that same database and say, well, now I'm going to query the navigation, and now I'm going to query this piece of content, and now I'm going to query the footer. And that means that the, the page load time and the number of queries could be substantial. And GraphQL is a more modern way of querying that, that backend system, where you can just do a single query and require and request everything you would need. So what you will see here is that it speeds up the, the performance of your, of your web application. And also, it's a much easier way for, let's say, uh, mobile applications or those single page applications I was just talking about to also get the content out of the system that they need. So these are yeah, modernizations that we've uh, implemented in our, tech, in our delivery technology to really align with the way companies should be building web experience and other digital experiences today. Great, Arian, that's a fantastic explanation. And, and to go into some more detail around the dynamic experience delivery is something that's very important around the headless uh, capabilities that are included. So back to that kind of middle tier layer is, is really a series of microservices that are made available to web developers. And quite honestly, from a product information perspective, this is one of the most exciting areas for us, is the ability now to interact with content that's come from, from that omni-content multiple sources. And so having the ability to have a series of microservices has the ability, for example, to include the ability to add uh, user commenting so there's a whole series uh, of capabilities to add comments or user-generated content and also do reporting on it, which we find is very important. So the ability for customers even to add comments and then for somebody in your company to privately review them. Also the ability to optimize the experience uh, for customers. Additional research has shown that uh, customers also want to see relevant information for the region. So for perhaps going back to my solar panels example, I may have very different uh, experiences for a customer that lives in the desert, let's say in Arizona, uh, New Mexico, versus somebody that lives in Amsterdam. Uh, it's I, both maybe the same panels, but I could have very relevant information for them and I can optimize that experience. The other area of these microservices also allow you to do services, things that are, are trending across people that are similar to you. Um, we see this a lot in consumer websites where, oh, someone with similar uh, interests is purchasing these kind of items, and these kind of suggestions can be made in this kind of dynamic experience delivery. The exciting part is, is that we have this ability now to mix and match based on the delivery that's required. And Arian, do you have any uh, particular favorites that you like here on this, on this slide? Well, you sort of alluded to it a little bit, but where it says experience optimization, personalization, and targeting, I think what is really cool now is that personalization has been, let's say, the realm of marketing. There, there is the notion, of course, of conditional uh, documents as well, where you put variables in your data documentation and you can sort of make it conditional. But it's not truly personalization. And I think what we're opening up now is the opportunity for product information to be delivered in a truly personalized way. So the capabilities that have been around for web content for many years are now suddenly becoming available for online delivery of product information as well, uh, because we're sharing the same technology across both types of information. So that's, that's really cool, I think, and that's a, that's a great step forward for delivering really tailored experiences that are not just marketing-centric, but that includes the in-depth product information that people are looking for as well, without giving them information they don't need. And if I go back to the PDF example of earlier, where you are looking for a specific feature or a specific answer to a question, uh, to a question, in many cases you would have to download the full PDF and then do Control F and try to dig through all those pages to find the, the, the particular, uh, well, maybe the model or the version that you are using from that product, and then a specific section. And when you think about what you can do with personalization, you can say, well, let's just filter dynamically all the content for that product 
by type, what is this user bought, or what are they looking at at this moment, and just deliver that specific snippet of information that is really relevant to them. So I think it's a completely different way of, of serving up the right information to a customer that is going to be much more yeah, relevant and that yeah, you're no longer wasting somebody's time with giving them all sorts of information they don't, they don't need. And that's Ari, really I cool, that's I think. Very Oh, cool. I, I agree because for product information, it's always been difficult. In the past, we've tried to create very, uh, uh, you know, user profiles, which quickly became obsolete. Where now, if I have the ability with this delivery mechanism to understand more about my user, perhaps I can start to assume they're an advanced user and they're looking for advanced details versus a beginning user and so forth. So imagine that information, that personalization is optimized and uh, based on, on characteristics that I'm, I'm sensing and learning about my uh, user as they're going through and reading my content on the website. So very exciting. So uh, kind of wrapping up to the end here, and we're, we're going to have a few questions here in a minute. So uh, for many of you uh, who are Tridian Docs customers, we did have a Tridian Docs 13 Service Pack 2 release, uh, which added some very exciting capabilities. Uh, one of the most important things that we see is that when we're publishing the content out from uh, the Tridian Docs and Tridian Site Systems, SDL has completely automated this capability uh, out of the box. So the publishing, the taxonomy applications, all the aspects that Ari and I are talking about on the publishing and, and that side is has been much more automated in our latest release. The other big thing that we've added in uh, Tridian Docs is support for JITA 1.3. That's the latest standard from OASIS. So we now can support that with our DTDs and schemas within the system. And then the final big uh, item that you saw on an earlier slide was the ability to synchronize taxonomies between Tridian sites and docs, which really is the engine behind the technology that allows us to produce this, this omni-channel content as we go out and do our delivery. OK, Arian, so what are going to yeah. be our next steps? So there's a couple of sort of final uh, closing comments I'd like to make. So first of all, there are a lot of interesting conversations happening on the STL community at community.stl.com. So if, if you haven't been there so far, please sign up and look there, because for Tridian Docs, for instance, we have webinars, we've got recordings, we've got discussions going on. So I think it's really worthwhile of, of keeping an eye on that. And you can also sign up for notifications for certain threads or certain types of information if you're interested in those particular ones so that you don't have to go back over and over again. So by all means, please join us on the community. Um, and you will also find, like I said, interesting recordings there. The other thing is, and this is, uh, yeah, I want to reiterate the importance of training. So whenever you're using uh, products like steel products or other enterprise software applications, um, it's quite easy to sort of yeah, underestimate the importance of good training because we sometimes speak to customers who say, well, oh, I didn't know your product could do this or I didn't know that was possible. Um, so just make sure you, you make sure that, that your employees, you know, the people that implement or maintain your system, get the proper training so they can get the most out of the technology that you already deployed today. Because it would be a shame if you are sort of not aware of certain features that could make a big impact on your day-to-day -day operations. Just by the, yeah, because it's maybe something that came up in the later version and you never trained somebody on the latest version of the product. So you see the curriculum here for STL Tridian Docs and Sites. So it ranges from fundamental trainings to very advanced training. So please reach out to us uh, or visit our website if you have any questions. We can do also training on sites or we can do classroom training, whatever is required for your needs. Uh, and you can email our education team at learn at stl.com. And the and other thing is, add, yeah, I was sorry. going to add real quick on the training is, um, is Kate did include uh, background information on Tridian Docs 13, which was a new release that we came out on last year. Many of you are thinking about upgrading. We also suggest uh, in upgrade some consulting time. For example, I mentioned the new DITA 1.3 standard. And SDL has experts that can assist you, not only with the software upgrade, but what, what benefits could you take advantage of in the new DITA 1.3? For example, there's a new troubleshooting topic. Uh, there's a new, uh, extensions for learning and training and so forth. So 
at SDL, upgrades are about the software as well as the benefits that we can provide you, the new capabilities and features. And so we really want to engage with our customers and help you understand how we can continue to help you to expand and uh, use cases within your company. Yeah, great addition, Chip. Thanks a lot for, uh, for adding that bit. And then, yeah, the final slide here is just some, some pointers to additional information. If you go to stl.com slash tridian dash docs, you will find the latest brochure and then watch new uh, data sheet and some other relevant information. So whenever you say, well, I'm interested in what are exactly the new features, etc., you will find some, some information downloads there. Tridian DX is the overarching solution that brings together our web content and structured content solutions. So if you want to learn more, you can go to stl.com slash tridiandx. And clearly, you can reach out to your account manager or, or fill out the contact form on stl.com if you want to know more. But of course, we, we hope that you would see contact with your account manager and discuss whatever questions or needs you, you, you have and would like to discuss. So with that, we've reached the final slide. And we can open up the floor for some questions and see if we can answer them. Great. Thanks, Arian, and thanks, Chip, for presenting today. Um, as I say, we're now going to open up to some questions. We've already got a couple come in, so we'll start with those. But if you do have any other questions, please pop them in the Q&A box, and hopefully we'll be able to answer them. OK, the first one that's come in is, what factors should a dev team consider when choosing a headless CMS if they want to integrate with SDL Trudy and DX? OK, I can start on that one, but chip in uh, if you want to chip. So, Tridian DX itself is the combination of Tridian Sites and Docs. And the way these two systems come together is through this, this omni-content layer, which we call dynamic experience delivery. And that is basically representing the headless part of our technology stack. So you've got the authoring environment for, for database content, which is Tridian Docs, the authoring environment. You've got an authoring environment for Tridian Sites. And both of them publish into this shared delivery tier which then exposes the content through a series of APIs. And that is what we call a headless CMS. So um, the question, I'm not sure if I fully understand it then, because if it says, what factors should the development team consider when choosing a headless CMS if they want to integrate with 3 dx But 3 dx is a headless CMS. Um, I think in general, if you're looking at headless CMSs, what is important is this notion of, OK, if I expose content through a series of APIs, which is what we are doing, do you actually have a standardized way of accessing multiple types of content that are served up from backend systems? So in the example we were going through today, we were showing how from a single delivery tier, you could access your web content. You could also access your commerce content. And you could access your product. Uh, and support information content so that you can bring them all together in a single experience. And I think that is critical for a headless CMS that you can expose multiple backend repositories through a single set of APIs uh, to join up that experience at the front end. And Ari and I would add into that around designing the user experience, user interface. So how are, you, how are your customers going to interact with this information? And, and, and it's very much um, about a user experience that you need to think about, especially if you're working with traditional product information, which has primarily in the past been topic-based that was a table of contents, more or less what we call the data map. Now you have the ability to serve up individual topics and so forth. Yeah. So you need to think about the user experience of how that's going to look, which is driven by a taxonomy. And then uh, the final thing I would suggest is that you think also about some of the way you're going to deploy the technology. Arian, you mentioned earlier that SDL, uh, Tridian DX, is supported both in the cloud-based or an on-premise. So we need to think about, you need to think about which deployment methodology do you want to use. And SDL, we have experts that can help you pick and choose. Primarily the choices around how are you going to fund a deployment, uh, what are the preferences of your IT group and so forth? Those are all aspects that we have experts that can assist you on those decisions. Yeah, great point, uh, Chip. Thank you. Great. Next question we've got is, this all sounds great, but how do I gain alignment with marketing on creating a blended experience? Yeah, that's a very interesting well, question because, yeah, yeah 
technology-wise, I think we've been showing today what's, what's possible. But yeah, from an organizational perspective, I think there's, there's, there can be quite some hurdles to actually get there. Uh, because traditionally, marketing and product groups have been pretty siloed. Um, and we, we see that in the way that well, digital experiences are being created and, and exposed today. There's the marketing content, and then there's the support section. And they don't really blend anywhere. So I think in trying to sell this story or convince marketing to look into this, I think the SEO story that we talked about earlier today is a great way to, to start that conversation because they're always scrambling for content. They're always resource constraints. So if you say, well, I can help you with some of your biggest problems around making your website easier to find, ending up higher in your rankings by providing you a lot of high quality content, which is the product information, I think you will definitely find a listening ear and I'm sure they will be open to uh, well to a discussion and see what, what jointly you can come up with in terms of, okay, what are the real steps that we could take as, a, as an organization, not as a department A or department B, but as an organization to really create an, an experience that is serving our customers better. So it's really breaking out of this idea that marketing owns the experience and product information sort of serves the, well, the, the after sale phase of the of the customer experience it's really about bringing it all together taking an outside in approach so what does our customer really want and some of the research findings that we were showing at the beginning of this presentation i think would be very good well food for thought for marketers also to take into account so if all these people say product information has the highest impact on better customer experiences well, I'm sure that the marketer will want to listen to what you have to say. So that's, I think talk about the benefits, talk about some of the real problems that they are struggling with that you can help them with in order to solve that. And I, I would say a good alignment point is around the taxonomy. Uh, specifically, marketers have done a very good job over the years developing rich taxonomies. And for many of us in product information, uh, taxonomies are newer, or, or at least some of the metadata values. So I find a lot of good alignment uh, uh, and for technical documentation, product information groups, we bring a lot of governance and process to the way content and the quality of the content. Um, and so there's a nice mixing there if you get the right people um, to really support, I think, Ari, and the uh, results that you saw, in the, you reported on the survey earlier about the customer experience improvement. That will definitely have impacts on your customer SAT scores. Yep, absolutely. Great, and we've just got one final question. I'm on an older version today. What are the benefits of, of upgrading, and how easy or difficult is it to upgrade? I'll take that from a Tridi and Docs perspective. Some of you may be running SDL Live Content Architect or uh, Knowledge Center, and what we've done at SDL is we've we've written a number of automation scripts to help with customer upgrades. We've listened over the years that customers. Uh, from our customers that upgrades needed to get more automated. So in Tridi and Docs, for example, we dramatically reduce the number of configuration files that get configured. Uh, we also centralized the uh, configuration of the dialog boxes. Uh, it's now one place, whether it's in the web or the client applications and so forth. So this has helped our professional services and SDL partners in also making upgrades uh, smoother. Um, the other thing is we're seeing a lot of adoption in Tridi and Docs 13 uh, for the reason is performance is significantly faster. So all the client tools are now 64-bit, as is the publishing applications. And you have the option of migrating your older publishing scripts. You can leave them at 32-bit, or you can update them to 64-bit. And we're seeing significant performance improvements along those lines. So. Again, uh, if you want to have some more information specific to your configuration, we can get the right SDL expert involved. And I know, Arian, on the Tridian Sites upgrades, there's similar results as well, correct? Yeah, so Tridian Sites, we've also put a lot of time and effort into upgrading, making upgrading easier there. The other part, of course, of this, this story is, is cloud, because we see, yeah, quite regularly, we see companies moving from an on-premises environment to a cloud-hosted environment where they hand over the actual maintenance and the upgrade to SDL. And hybrids are an option as well, depending on whether you want to keep certain pieces of the technology on premises and maybe other parts in the cloud. 
but facilitating or simplifying upgrades, of course, is also well, <laughs> really well. It's really supported by moving to the cloud because then it's no longer your your job to upgrade your environment. SGL is actually taking care of the hassle of doing that. Of course, in close collaboration with you, but. Uh, you don't need all the technical skills and all the uh, in-depth knowledge anymore about how do we upgrade. It's simply part of the service level agreement with SDL that we perform those upgrades on your behalf so that you're always on the latest version and you can always enjoy the, the latest and greatest features that we are adding to the product. So, Kate, with that, are there any final questions that came in? No, that was the last question. Okay. Okay, so great. I think that concludes our presentation. So thanks everyone for attending the webinar. Uh, don't forget to have um, to visit the links and attachments section, um, where you'll find actually some useful information, in, including a link to the the Tridian Docs uh, landing page. Um, we hope you found today's session useful, and we look forward to seeing you again on one of our next webinars. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.